Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. I appreciate you having uh, given the opportunity for other preachers to be here uh, in the last couple of Sundays. We've had uh, Mike Napier and then we had Kent Markham. Uh, this is the month of October, our missions focus month. And uh, we had wonderful presentations on the work that's going on for the Gospel Chariot Ministries from Mike Napier on the continent of Africa. And then if you were here last week, you heard Kent talk about some of the work progress in Ecuador. And if you were able to meet following the morning worship, we had a short get together with those that are interested in perhaps taking a mission trip to Ecuador, not next summer but the one following that and so Kent was able to answer some of our preliminary questions about that and I was really really encouraged by the number of people that are interested in going on one of these mission trips now if you notice the banner hanging here on the north wall it says momentum and part of the momentum vision uh, that we started to address a couple of years ago was the desire that our elders have for as many of our church members to be involved in mission work as is possible. I've heard some congregations that have engaged a plan of 90% of their membership to be going into a mission field somewhere, whether that is across the ocean or somewhere in the local neighborhood, but to be involved in missions. As an incentive for that, the elders had designated money to be set aside from the missions budget to be a part of seed money for those that are from this church that would be interested on going in on going on one of these trips. And what the plan has been recently is that uh, one year we'll do a short distance mission trip. That would be in the odd year. And in the even year, we would do a long distance mission trip. And so far the plan has worked well. We've had two years of this now. We've had $250 given to those on short distance trips and $500 to each one on long distance trips. And that's what we want to continue to do. So that's going to be a part of next year's missions budget as well. Uh, coming up, we should be looking at short distance trips. So anybody interested in going on a mission trip like this ought to be talking to us and let, uh, we haven't formed a plan of where we're going yet. And maybe it's the following year if you want to go to Ecuador. Uh, because that, that's an opportunity that we want to help out with. Now, if you're visiting with us today, if you're our guest, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. But we also want to put this disclaimer out. Because I am going to be preaching on money this morning for a little bit. And it's not something we do a lot of. Uh, obviously, we believe in the work of the Lord being supported financially. Uh, and for 51 weeks of the year... Uh, every week's contribution goes towards the work that is necessary, all the bills to get paid, all the salaries and everything is off of that 51 week plan. And that's including local works of service in missions and, and benevolence. And then we take one week of the year, that 52nd week, which is for us gonna be next Sunday, the last Sunday of October, we always designate as Mission Sunday. And it's a one-time contribution for the work that we support other than here. Other than here. In other words, all the places that we've been talking about, India, Ecuador, Africa, the Westview Boys Home in Hollis, Oklahoma, as we help support that, the TV ministry known as the Search Program, which by the way, a TV ministry that does not publicly on the broadcast itself ask for any donations whatsoever. That ministry is supported totally by congregations like ourselves that give to that and support to it. There's no money being asked for uh, by the search program and we help support that as well as some of the other things we're able to help out with AIM students that are going to different places or we're able to help out with our own that wanna go on one of these mission trips. So next Sunday is Mission Sunday. The reason I'm gonna preach on money today is because the collection plate has already gone around and by the time I'm to preach next week, the money would have already been collected. So this is the time I use to get more blood out of the turnip, as they say. But I just don't want our guests to think that we do this all the time. 
So get ready. I'm going to come along and twist everybody's arm individually and give till it hurts. Or as one preacher has said, reach into the pocket of the person next to you and give like you've always wanted to. (laughs) But I want us to start off this morning with a text from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And while you're turning there, I'm going to put a little bit of a plug here for Friend Day. We're two weeks away. On November 4th, we are asking everybody in this church, I'm expecting everybody here this morning that can hear my voice to invite, to personally invite people to be guests of yours in the morning worship assembly. And we want to pack the house. We'd like to see what it looks like when we have 220 people in here. And that's what we're going for as a goal. That's what we'd like to see our church become, that large. And we want to start off by just inviting our guest. Ask your neighbor, ask a friend, ask somebody you work with, ask somebody, even even if they don't live in town, Go ahead and invite them to our worship here and let them know that our preacher has a encouraging sermon about Friends Day and it's going to be uplifting singing. And then what I'm also asking you to do is invite them for a meal afterwards. Now we're not going to do a meal here at the building. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is we're already having a shower that evening for one, but we also have some conflicts. There are Uh, people here involved with basketball and this is a perfect opportunity for you by the way the basketball boosters are doing a chicken noodle chili dinner after church on November the 4th at the high school at the student center and that'd be a great opportunity for you to help provide your guest with a meal plus you're helping a local sports program as well isn't that great and the ladies are going, yay, I don't have to cook for Sunday morning. But you can have them in your home if you would like to do that or take them out to eat. But that is an option. But a lot of us, coach, players, and parents, and booster club members that have to be at the other place for that. And it's, uh, is it five? Five dollars. Uh, five dollars. So that, that would be a great incentive for you and a great incentive for your friend to say, yeah, I'll come. And you're going to feed them afterwards. Please be thinking about that. Pledge yourself to do that, to invite somebody to be your guest on November 4th, Friend Day. Okay. Romans 10 verse 1, Paul the Apostle starts off with these words. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel to be saved. Now in another place in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul has made it very clear that he was willing to become all things to all men. That by all means, some would be saved. He was willing to set aside even personal preferences for the sake, if, if, if somebody could be saved, I would become whatever I need to become, that's within, of course, a morally accepted realm, in order that I can reach that one to be saved. He said that in 1 Corinthians 9, and here he's saying, my heart's desire for Israel is that they be saved. We know he has the same sentiment towards Gentiles, but that all people everywhere be saved. Paul had a burning desire that people wouldn't have to burn, condemned to hell. He had a passion of love so that people could experience a lasting eternity with God because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Paul the apostle wrote the majority of what we have as our New Testament. And in every letter that he wrote to either congregations or individuals has its central main focus of growing God's kingdom. And one of my favorite letters that he wrote is this one, the letter to the Romans. And so as he starts this off in verse 1, we can move on down to verse 14. And he says... How then can they, he just said in verse 13, everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he says in verse 14, how, can, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Now this is a series of questions from verses 14 through 15. And I'm going to help us dissect these questions very methodically. I want you to notice that the antecedent to this pronoun, they, refers to the Israelites and the Gentiles that are lost. 
just to put it in our language today, anybody not saved. Because isn't it logical? If you're not saved, you're lost. There's only one of two categories here to be in. You're either in the saved category or in the lost category. The they in this passage refers to those that need saving. In other words, they're lost. If you look at that preceding verse, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Saved. Let's say it again. Will be what? Saved. Okay. So we're talking about the they, the ones that are not yet saved, but that he wants saved, that he's prayed to be saved, that he has prayed that they'll believe and call on the name of the Lord, that he's that he has said, I'll become all things to all men so that they will be saved. This is who they refers to. How can they call on the one they have not believed in? Now, the one is pretty simple. Jesus. Jesus is the one. Jesus taught himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, verse 6. Jesus says, unless, a, unless one believes that I am the one I claim to be, you will die in your sins. In other words, not be saved. That's John chapter 8, verse 24. He talks about repentance in Luke 13, 3. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Then he, in a discussion with Nicodemus in John 3, in verse 16, a passage familiar with all of you, I'm sure. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In other words, Jesus was all about people changing their lives and being coming, committed to him so that they be saved. One of his final parting words to the disciples before he ascended back to heaven to be with the Father was to go into all the world to teach people the gospel. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. That's Mark 16, verse 16. So going back now to this Romans 10, verse 14, how then can they, the lost, call on the one Jesus, they, the lost, have not believed in? That question is followed by another question. What's the next question in verse 14? And how can they, the lost, believe in the one Jesus, of whom they, the lost, have not heard? So the loss so far in these two questions in Paul's scenario that he's painting for us is they've not believed and the reason they haven't believed is they haven't even heard. You can't believe in something you don't know about. You can't believe in someone you haven't met. Does that make sense? Just nod your head yes and those that are nodding off sleeping you're agreeing with us, okay? So. They need to hear first and then they can believe and you can't believe without hearing about the message, the gospel. So that's question two. And there's a third question in this verse. And how can they, the lost, hear, which is needed for believing, without someone preaching to them? Now who's the someone? We know who the they are. We know who the one is. Who is the, or who are the, they, or without the someone, who is the someone? And that is someone publicly proclaiming the message. They can't believe unless they've heard, and they got to hear to believe. But in order to hear, something needs to be told. These are the preachers, or the missionaries. These are the people that are going out sharing their faith. The ones that are going to where these lost people are. Now, let's look at verse 15, and we have more questions. And how can they preach unless they are sent? Now, in this verse, the they is not referring to the lost as it was in verse 14. Here it's referring to now the next one under discussion, the someone that's preaching. They are the they in verse 15. How can they preach unless they, the preachers, are sent? And then you have not a question, but you have an exclamation, a, a, a conclusion to this. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And this is actually a quote 
from Isaiah chapter 52. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And the feet and those are referring to the preachers. So let's uh, now kind of take what we have examined here. We've got the lost in the world, and what do they need to do first in order to believe? They need to hear. That's right. Now, they can't hear unless somebody's there to tell. And those are the preachers. So we got the lost identified. We've got the preachers identified, or those that don't have to be pulpit preachers necessarily. They can be missionaries. They can be Sunday school teachers. They can be various Christians who have gone out and are continuing to go out to share their faith. They're going out into different areas wherever the lost are, and they're telling the good news of the one, and the one has been identified as Jesus Christ. We got that so far. But it says something here. There's, a, there's something implied within one of these questions that involves someone we haven't mentioned yet. I want you to direct your attention back again to the very first question that's in verse 15. The only question in verse 15. How can they preach unless they are sent? Sent. In order for something to be sent, what must also exist? A sender. Do you see that? The one that is sent has something to take with them. The good news of the one, of Jesus Christ. And there is already a recipient mentioned the lost of the world is the recipient. They are the recipients. So you got the recipients, you've got the package, you've got the person that is being talked about, and the gospel message itself is whom the preachers, the ones who are going to be sent, the ones who are the someone preaching. But what about who's sending? Now, look at your neighbor to your right. And if you're all doing that, you're looking at the back of someone's head, probably. Look at the neighbor to your left. All right, now just look up and down the row, sideways to your left and to your right. Just kind of uh, meander with your eyes. Now look forward ahead of you. And turn around and look behind you. Just go ahead. Feel free to do that. Look around. See who's sleeping, waking them up, okay? <laughs> Tell them Mission Sunday is today to get your wallet out. Whom you have looked at identifies who the sender is. The ones you've looked at identifies who the senders are. Does that make sense? That's basically it for that text. Paul says, I've poured my heart out in prayer and becoming all things to all men so that everybody be saved. And the, I think the point that needs to be made here is we need to be like Paul because Paul had a heart like God did for the lost. And we need to have a heart like God does for the lost. A love like Jesus has for the lost. Amen? What did Jesus come to do? To seek and save the who? The saved? No, the lost. Jesus is all about the church, but he's not just interested in who he already has, the church. He is interested in who he doesn't have, the lost of this world. And what was true for the first century over 2,000 years ago is true to this day. And he is all about the church, but what he's really about is not all about the church just being the church. He's all about the church being the senders to get the message of him out into the rest of the world today. And that requires our help. And that is why it is so important that on Mission Sunday, we take a look at how we're doing as senders. For 51 weeks of the year, we're doing pretty good. We're holding our own, so to speak, on helping fund what we need going on here. But what about sending the people? This will be the measure of how well we're doing on sending the people to the ones of this world that are lost. It would be a part of our 
participation in sending the preachers and the missionaries, those gospel chariots in Africa, or Ricky Goodham and the other preachers in India where we also support, or the work that's going on in Ecuador, whether that's preaching the gospel, or helping with the children's homes, or helping with the medical missions we learned about last week in Kumani up on the Kayapas River. And each one of those three works I just mentioned, we have pledged $8,000 for each year to go towards those works. That's a part of the 34,000. And we have also parceled out some of that money to go to the Westview Boys Home for the children's home in Hollis, Oklahoma, as well as the search program and the works that we also support with college students going on trips and the money that we want to seed our own members going on some of these mission field trips. That's why 34,000 is the goal. Because not too long ago, I preached a sermon based on Acts chapter 17 when Paul was on Mars Hill as he stood there in, in the meeting of the Areopagus. He had already been talking with Jews in the synagogue and then he'd been talking to some of the Stoic and Greek philosophers and they are the ones that wanted him to go up here on this hill and talk to the people there. And he'd already noticed the city had been full of idols. And then he directs their attention to the one idol he's standing next to with the inscription to the unknown God. And he says, this God whom you worship you don't know, he's the one I want to tell you about. And not too long ago, earlier in the year, I preached from this saying that one of the things we need to understand about our God is you can't have but one. And that he has to be known. You can't have a God who's unknown. And I said, there are two ways on which he needs to be known. Number one, he needs to be known to you personally. That you have a deep relationship with him. That you don't just know about him, that you know some facts. You know, the, the accumulation of facts and technical data, that's knowledge. Wisdom is how you apply your knowledge through life experiences in the appropriate way. I heard just recently on the radio described to me this way. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is to know you don't put it in fruit salad. Okay? Some of us grew up learning a lot of scriptures, memorizing a lot of verses, and I encourage that. I really do. But it's got to go beyond the ink on the paper for you to have a relationship with God. And God says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Hosea 4 verse 6. That's the one level in which he cannot be unknown to you. But the second level that you can't have an unknown God is you can't have a God that maybe it's known to you, but you haven't made him known to anybody else in your world. What Paul was doing there that day on Mars Hill was saying, I'm making him, whom I already know, known to you. And the Bible says that's the part that we ought to be playing as the church. That in Psalm 105, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, and make known among the nations what he has done. That's the gospel news being broadcasted. Make known among the nations in India, Ecuador, Africa, wherever it is there are lost people, and that's all over this world, that we need to participate in being the ones who send, to be the ones who send. I'll close with this from 1 Timothy. We read it in our class this morning. It says in 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 3, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He's the one who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time, and for this purpose... I was appointed a herald and an apostle. Paul says God wants men everywhere to be saved. So next Sunday, and all through this week, as you think about what you and your family are able to do and want to do on Mission Sunday, I want you to think about this year being an investment. An investment. Now some of you may play the stock market, and I don't, I'm not a day trader. I, I might have... Uh, mutual funds somewhere that I'm not even paying a lot of attention to, but some of you might know how the market works. And it's an investing tool. It's an investment. Do you know if you had 
at the IPO period of Amazon bought $100 worth of shares, that would have bought five shares, that today that would have been about $120,000, 120,000% increase. There's many stories where you can say, if you, if you had like $100 in this, look at what you'd be today. Amazing stories. Of course, hindsight's 2020, right? All of us would like to know, well, what would become that now at its entry level so that I can buy low and sell high? What, what, what would be that? I don't know. What are the numbers for the lottery for $1.6 billion? I don't know. But I can tell you the other night when I was in Ponca City, lines were out the door because people want a piece of that and they're trying to buy that. I want to suggest to you today that for next Sunday, you think about investing in something other than money. How about investment in souls? It's what Jesus invested his whole life on, was into the winning of souls. It's what Paul invested his whole life on was an investment in souls that all people could be saved, that someone might be saved. Your part of next week's contribution is a role that you play that's divinely ordained by God to become your part of how you invest and the return on souls is much greater. You know why? If you were to win that lottery, is it Mega Millions? I'm trying to act like I don't know so that you know that I don't buy tickets. Mega millions, 1.6 billion, really? How much of it will get to heaven with you? How much? Zero. Zero. But if you invest next week into the saving of souls, we have seen evidence of this every single year we've had Mission Sunday or we've been sending out mission help To anybody in this world, there have always been souls that are saved. How many souls that are saved will we see in heaven? Every one of them that are faithful. This past trip to India back in July that I was able to get on in Jordan and my daughter Lindy, 42 people were baptized into Christ. I have every hope to see 42 additional people in heaven because we invested a little time and a little money. And because of last year, you invested some in helping us go. You sent us along with others that were helping us. And you'll get a return on the investment when you invest in souls. So next week, you're investing in souls. It's not to the preacher's salary. It's not to the electric bill. It's not to, we don't have any debt. It's not to do any debt maintenance. goes to mission work, all an investment in souls. This morning, I want to make sure that you know that you're saved. Have you heard? Have you believed? Have you repented, confessed? Have you been baptized in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? These were all the directives Jesus taught while he was here. This is what the New Testament teaches on how we can be saved. This is the process of calling on the name of the Lord. And if you need to do that this morning, we're going to stand and sing this song. And you can come up to the front, we'll take care of that. Just like Rachel did the other night, you can do that too and be a part of the group in heaven. Won't you come as we stand and sing?